teach you a new one. Jump in when you're ready. Yeah. 
How's everybody doing? You doing well this morning? There it is. Hey, I got a question for you before I send you the greeting. <laughs> who, who has broken their New Year's resolution already? It's no shame. We're all family. We love each other. Let's support each other, encourage one another. Maybe we can get back on the wagon. All right? All right. You got 60 seconds. Ready, set, go. You guys, are you confessing to each other right now? I hear a lot of confessions going on. <laughs> Good morning. How are we doing? Hey, my name is Jennifer. And uh, if you're new around here, we are grateful you're here. We want to welcome you. Can we just give a shout out to new people? Like, we've seen a lot of new faces. So welcome. We're grateful you're here. We're grateful you're spending some time with us. And we actually uh, would love it if you would fill out a connect card. This is something that allows us to know you're here. And it allows us also to give you a gift. Just a little gift to say thanks for spending some time with us and joining us. Um, and you can find that on our website, lakesurchurch.org. And you just click I'm new and there's a form there or if you're here in the room you can come over to guest central afterwards and uh say hi we would love that as well um we have something really cool going on next sunday evening um our first worship night of this year i almost said 2021 no it's 2022 our first worship night next sunday night so we start out with food trucks yes worship how is that wor that worship was incredible today you guys so uh if you love worshiping come next sunday five 5.30, Chris, still, you got to calm down. Okay. <laughs> She's very excited. Um, 5.30, food trucks. At 6.30, we'll start worshiping. But come, get some dinner, hang out, worship God together. Uh, it's going to be a great time. <laughs> and uh, the only way, it's hard for me to, to do this when there's a lot of noise happening, but I love the noise. Yes. <laughs> um, when... Okay, when we do all these really cool things, right? We do some cool things, but the only way we can do it is because of your partnership with us. And so we're so grateful for the generosity of this church, um, incredibly generous church. And so if you haven't had a chance yet to partner with us and you feel God is calling you that way, uh, we've made it super easy for you. You can go to our website, uh, find a link there to give, or our app has a giving link as well, um, or we have boxes at the exits where you can drop your gift. So thanks for being patient with me, you guys. I love you. And uh, we're we're going to continue with our series, Real Change. Mike's got a great message. Happy Sunday. Thank you. 
How's everybody doing today? It's good. I mean, Jennifer got the crowd all warmed up for us this morning. I uh, want to say just a quick second just to say how grateful I am uh, for everyone who's tuning in online. I, I'm just blown away by the opportunity and the ability that we have, not just to reach people in our community, but the opportunity we have to reach people in every community. So whether you're in the room or online, thank you so much for joining with us today. We're continuing in our series, Real Change, and we kicked it off last week by really talking about where does real change come from? And if you were here, I showed you a chart like this. If you weren't here, I want to quickly run you through this. I think it will help uh, kind of understand where I'm coming from. But when, when we think about change, real change begins here in this center circle. It begins and it's tied to our identity. It's not what we do or how we do it. It's who we are. When we see ourselves as something, when we find our identity, then that in turn drives our process to our outcomes. It helps us achieve what we're going after. But when it comes to New Year's resolutions, habits, <coughs> or goals, most of us actually think the other way around. We don't think from the inside out, we think from the outside in. We first think about the outcomes that we want. So for example, it, it, it maybe one of your resolutions this year was like, I wanna do, um, I wanna save more money. Like that's the outcome I want, I wanna save more money. And so we set that, this is, this is what I'm going after, this is my goal or my habit that I'm trying to form for 2022. And then we know we need to build a process around it. We need to build a plan, so we'll say, okay, every paycheck I will auto deduct out of my checking account into my savings account and that will help me save more money. We have, we have an outcome in mind, we have a process that we have a plan for, but it's not a dealing or dressing with the identity piece because if the identity piece isn't sort of locked in, then the same old habits will continue to form our new behaviors. And so if we continue to spend more money than we make, even if we decide we want to save and put savings in our account, if we're spending more than we make, it's immediately coming out of our savings account and going to pay bills because we haven't changed our identity piece. Understanding the identity piece begins to form and change the other habits that you have. Now, while the Apostle Paul wasn't talking about shopping, he reminded himself of this very thing, of the importance of contentedness, the importance of the identity piece. And this is what he says in sort of rejoicing about, about what's going on in his life. Paul says these words in Philippians chapter 4. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance." When Paul says, I have learned, what he's referring to is not head knowledge. Maybe a more thoughtful translation here would be, I have learned by heart. Essentially what Paul's saying is not that I know what it means to be content, I know. It's not just what I can understand, it's a part of who I am. My identity is rooted in my contentedness. This is absolutely critical when it comes to habit formation. And when we have our identity right, everything else will fall into line, which is last week why I gave you guys the challenge to go home and to begin to think about the identity that you wanted to be. Think about the person that you wanted to be. Because again, the more we say it, the more we can internalize it, the more we start to believe it. And I hope that you went home and did it. I did. I went home and I thought about, okay, this year, what, what do I want my identity to be? To begin to form some of the, the behaviors and habits and the outcomes that I want to, uh, I want to see in my life. And so I, I sat down, I thought about it, I prayed about it, and this is my identity statement. I, I will do everything I can to honor God, my family, and my body each and every day of my life. I'm gonna do everything I can to honor God. When I wake up, I'm gonna honor God with my life. When I, when I wake up, I'm gonna honor family, my family with my life. When I wake up, I'm gonna honor this body that God has given me with my life. Like that's who I, and I say it every day, that's who I am. I'm someone who's gonna honor God, my family, and my body each and every day of my life. That was my identity statement. Hopefully you spent some time thinking about what that is for you in your life because then we can start talking about how we build some habits around it. Now, last week after church, someone shared with me something that his father always said to him, and I loved it, so I want to share it with you. His father used to always say to him, you are what you have been becoming. That's so profound, because it's so true. You are what you have been becoming. What you experience in life is the sum total of not your desires, but it's the sum total of your habits. 
The Duke University did a research study on this. They're trying to figure out the effects of habits on a person's life, and they concluded roughly 40 to 50% of your life is not the result of conscious decisions, but habits. I mean, think about that. 40 to 50% of your life is not the result of conscious decisions, but habit. And you can overlay on that that as humans, we sleep about a third of our life. So what we know is roughly in the neighborhood of 75 to 85% of all of the things that we do in life are the byproducts of the habits that we put in place. Daily habits that change or form who we are becoming. Now we see this play out in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we're introduced to someone named Daniel. At the time where we first meet Daniel, he is a teenager, a teenager who has been kidnapped, who's been taken away, who's just been displaced into a foreign land under the, the rule of the Babylonian Empire, which was like, if you will, the global superpowers of the day. And this young man finds himself in a foreign nation, and he does what would probably be so foreign to many of us. He doesn't, he doesn't go around and complain. Like, if this was me, if I was just a teenager who was kidnapped, whose life was taken away from me, if I was put into a foreign, different land and just been forced to live there, like, I would complain. Most of us would complain, but Daniel doesn't complain. Instead, he makes the decision to live a solid, consistent life. And over time, his character begins to shine through. Over time, through these small decisions, living this consistent, solid life, eventually the king takes notice. And he ends up promoting Daniel to be second in command. Essentially, Daniel is tasked with being the second person in charge over the entire nation. Now, it would be easy for us to look at Daniel's life and think this is a simple case of being in the right place at the right time. Like Daniel, it just, he just showed up. It was the right place at the right time. This is a, a perfect illustration of coincidence. But what I want us to understand that this has nothing to do with coincidence. This happened to Daniel because of his character. And when you look at Daniel's life, when you read through and you study Daniel's life, what you see is again and again that there's these small daily habits that help us understand where his character is rooted in. Rooted in. We see an example of this in Daniel chapter 6. In, in verse 10, look at what Daniel does right after he receives some bad news that was greatly, going to greatly affect him. Now, when Daniel, verse 10, learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times... A day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he'd done before. So David, or Daniel receives this bad news, and what does he do? He goes upstairs, he goes into his room, he opens the window that has a great view of Jerusalem. He doesn't sit there and stare out the window at Jerusalem. Instead, he gets on his knees. I think that's a powerful implication there. Like, they, they acknowledge the view, but then by getting on his knees, he's removing his eyes from the view to focus on what's actually more important, to focus on God. And three times every single day, Daniel gets down on his knees and prays. You see, the source of Daniel's strength, the foundation of his character, was his relationship with God, developed daily through the habit of prayer. This wasn't just what Daniel did. This was who he was. It was one small habit that produced transformative results in his life. And that's what we want. Like when it comes to our New Year's resolutions, when it comes to our new habits, what all of us want is what Daniel had. We want the same thing. We want transformative results. And so I want to spend some time this morning talking a little bit about that. Like, how do we get transformative results when it comes to new habits? How do we, how do we institute a handful of critical behaviors into our life that can help aid us in forming some of the habits that we want to have in our lives? And here's the first thing, and this might surprise you, it surprised me. When it comes to forming and sustaining a new habit, motivation has literally nothing to do with it. 
When you want to form a new habit in your life, it has nothing to do with motivation. And we know this because there was a research study that was done out of the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, they took 250 participants who, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> who had a stated desire to start working out at the beginning of a new year. And so they said, they, okay, 250 people, they divided them into three groups. To the first group, what they said is they said, look, you, you, you want to work out. This is a habit that you have in your life. You, you, you're motivated to do it. Just go work out. Only thing we're going to ask you to do is when you work out, actually log what you did, how long you did, the day you did it. Log your workout. Now, to the second group, they said we want you to do the same thing as the first group. We want you to go out. We want you to, to work out. We want you to log the workout, the day and the time that you did it. But they'd also decided to give them some motivational resources. Like listen to this podcast, read this book, watch this video, help understand how all of this ties together to make you healthier in the long term. So they gave them some motivation, told them to go out, log it, do these things. Now to the third group, they said, here's the thing. I don't want, I'm not going to give you any motivational resources. What I want you to do is I want you to work out. I want you to log your workouts. But here's the one other thing I want you to do. I want you to pick a consistent time and place that you'll be working out. Like name the time, name the place that you're going to put this new habit into practice and stick with it consistently day in and day out. Now, when the study concluded, they looked at the first two groups of people and essentially there were the same outcomes. 35% of the first group, the group that was just told to go work out, 35% of them reached the goal that they were striving after. Now, the group that they added motivation to, give these resources and tools to help kind of spur them along, that group, 38% of people completed and achieved their goals. Thank you. Now, the last group, the group that was given no motivational tools, but it told to pick a time and a place to work out, do you care to guess how many of them completed their goals? 60. What's the other ones? 70. Do I hear 80? Do I? 91%. 91% of them achieved the goal that they were after. And here's why. Because habits have nothing to do with motivation. It's not about want to. It's not about what we want to. And that's where we get so mixed up. We think, I just want to do this. I want to do it. And if I want it bad enough, then I'm going to see the change that I want to. It has to do with our identity. But then it includes a defined process to drive us towards our desired outcome. So here's the thing. If you're trying to develop the habit of praying more, maybe that was your, your resolution. You're like, this year, I want to spend more time in prayer. That's, that's the outcome. Okay, so then what's the process? Okay, so then the process is every day I'm going to spend a little bit of time with God. But we need to go beyond just process. We need to make this so obvious that we couldn't possibly not do it. And so how do we make it obvious? Well, we pick a time and place. Like, I want to spend more time in prayer. How am I? How am I going to do that? Every morning at 7 a.m., I'm going to go downstairs, and I'm going to sit in this chair, and I'm going to pray. We've made it incredibly obvious. Now, the other thing that we can do when it comes to sort of driving these habits is we can give ourselves vi visual or audio cues that make it even easier. So, for example... I'm going to go down 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to pray every morning. I'm going to do it in this chair. And in that chair is my prayer journal that's laying open with a pen on top of it. It's already clicked, and so it's ready to go. And at the same time, I'm going to set my phone, because how many of us, the first thing we do in the morning is we look at our phones? Be honest. There's a lot more hands that suddenly go up. So then we think, okay, well, at 7 o'clock, because our phone's probably in our hands, it's going to go off, and it's going to say what? Go to the chair and go pray. Like, we have to make these habits so obvious, so easy, that we can't possibly not do them. The time and place is a cue. The audio or visual identifications, they are cues. In his book, Atomic Habits, James Clear, James Clear notes that cues trigger our brains to initiate behavior. That these things, they cue our brains to initiate behavior. If you want to start running every single morning, put your, put your running shoes on the floor of your bed. Literally go to bed, sleep in your running shoes. Get up in the morning, slide your feet in, go out the door. Make it obvious. Make it so obvious that you couldn't possibly not do it. And it's important for us that it's obvious. The second critical behavior is that it's incredibly important that it is easy. 
It can't just be obvious. It can't just be like, I got my running clothes on, I got my shoes here, and I'm going to go run 26 miles every day. Like, that's not easy. No one's going to do it. It has to be incredibly easy because here's the thing. Bad habits take almost no effort, right? Like binge watching Netflix, how much effort does that take? Like literally they, they have built it so that when one show is over, we don't even have to move our thumbs to hit play. Like as soon as one show's over, the next show starts. It, it takes literally no effort to do something bad. Ordering pizza, it doesn't take a lot of effort. I pick up the phone. I don't even pick up the phone anymore. I open my phone and I go into the app. I order the pizza and like in 40 minutes, it shows up at my house. It's incredibly easy. It's harder when we try to start new habits because we don't make them easy. There's like this new craze about meal prepping. And I'm always blown away by people who do this. Like they post on Instagram or on Facebook and they show like all of their lunch meals or their dinner meals for the month. And they spent the whole weekend doing that. And I'm like, A, props to them. Like that's incredible. I'm so amazed by what they did. But that is a lot of work. Like, and think about that. If you want to develop a habit of prepping your meals to eat healthier, you're basically committing every weekend to this practice every single day. A bag of chips is a whole lot easier than prepping our meals. We have to make our new habits so easy to start that it pulls us away from the allure of the already easy bad habits that we have. Like, it's just like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do this. Why? Because it's easy. It's just as easy for me to watch Netflix as it is for me to, like, get on a treadmill and run for a minute and a half. And I know you're like, what's going to change in a minute and a half? Change happens with small daily improvements over time that will produce transformative results. Make it easy. Start simple. That's especially true when it comes to our relationship with God. Now, we live in such a performance-driven culture. Like we want to achieve. We get, we get allotted for achieving. It happens when we're a very young age. People acknowledge us when we stand out because we achieve. We, we get promoted within business because we strive, because we, we achieve, because we perform. And so what happens, because we live in it day in and day out, it begins to shape and form how we see ourselves and our relationship with God. That many of us feel the need to perform for God, we think, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read more, I'm going to learn more, I'm going to study more, I'm going to grow more to know more about God. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus addressed this reality head on. In chapter 11, Jesus concludes with a rather shocking statement. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and reveal them to little children. I mean, Jesus goes off this like period where he's teaching people, and he comes to this point where he begins to praise God that he has hidden the things of God from people who consider themselves wise. People whose entire life pursuit was to chase after God, to know more about God. And then in verse 26 through 28, Jesus goes on to say, look, the, the, if you want to know God, the only way that you can know God is through him, that God is revealed in his son, Jesus. And so then again, this is what we do. We live in a performance-driven culture. We strive. We like to achieve. We think, okay, well, then I need to know everything about Jesus, I need to read more about Jesus. I need to learn more about Jesus. I need to study more about Jesus to grow more like Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pursue all this, to do all this, to, to get achieved, to get to know God more, to perform for God. But what does Jesus say? He says this in verse 29 and 30. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle, he says, and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now the term that Jesus uses here for yoke has two meanings. Often we focus on the first one. This is essentially, if you've never seen this before, this is a, a yoke. It is, it is intended to bind to cattle or to oxen 
together, there is this implication, the meaning of what Jesus says, is that when we become his followers, we're bound to him, that our lives are connected in such a way that they cannot be separated from him. That's, the, that's what we focus on a lot of the time, but there's a secondary meaning of what Jesus is talking about, and that has to do with his teachings. He's referring to his teachings. He tells us that in verse 29, take my yoke upon me and learn from me. Learn about my teachings. And then he goes on, he says, what are these teachings? They're easy, they're light. These teachings are not burdensome, which probably begs the question, or at least it should, then what is this teaching? What is it that we're supposed to know? And it's summarized with the greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, in all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it means. Like if you want to know what it means to follow Jesus with all of your life, it's not about just knowing more. It's about doing these things. It's not about developing this aspect, but it's about developing this aspect. It's not that our brains know him, but our identity is rooted in him. It's about our pursuit of him daily. That we wake up and we say, God, I will love you with everything. Everything that I have. Which, yes, it's part of our mind, but it's also part of the how do we tangibly live out our faith. How do we impact the lives of other people? How do people come into contact with us and they walk away and they say, that person has been with Jesus. Like that's what we see consistently again and again in the, in the New Testament. It should impact our lives, our relationship with God, and our love for other people. Now that's what he's talking about. Now I want to be clear, and I think you'll see as I get a little bit, li- a little bit further on in this message, that I'm not saying that it's not important to develop some habits when it comes to deepening in our pursuit of God. That's incredibly important, but it should not be burdensome. And when it comes to our habits, especially God habits, we have a tendency to make it burdensome. And so maybe your habit is like, look, I, I want to start inviting people to church. My guess is because we're overachievers, you're like, I'm going to, every single weekend, I'm going to invite someone to church. And we, we just put this huge burden on ourselves. And so what if we said, look, this year, I'm going to invite one person to church. I mean, think about the, uh, the impact on that. I've heard the slogan before, each one reach one. Uh, what if each one of us reached one person, one family with our lives this year? What impact would that have on the kingdom of God? More importantly, what transformative impact would it have on a person's life? But it's not burdensome. It's, it's easy. One person, this whole year, that's what I'm going to do. Maybe for some of you, when it comes to just, again, the deepening of your relationship with God, you just, you just come up to the plate and you swing for a home run on the first at bat. Like if people go like, I don't read my Bible at all, I'm going to read my Bible in a year. Like you go from, I don't read a verse of the Bible, to I'm going to read at least three to five chapters every single day. Like, that, that, that's, that's burdensome. That, that's probably not something you're going to accomplish, especially if you just think you're going to will yourself to do it. Instead of swinging for the fences, what would it look like for us to just try to hit a single? And here's why this is important. I don't want you to miss this. Life change doesn't happen when we do big things occasionally. It happens when we do small things consistently. I'm going to say that again. Life change doesn't happen when we do big things occasionally. I did that one time. I'm going to read my Bible in 90 days. I don't read my Bible every 90 days, like the whole Bible every 90 days. But I'm going to do it. It's going to change everything. It changed some things, but we think, well, I'm going to do big things occasionally. It's going to have life change. It doesn't. Small things done consistently lead to a changed life. So make it obvious, make it easy, something you can attain. And the last part of this is this, make it known. This is such an critical part to this. Make the new habit known. Whatever it is, whatever habit you want to form in your life, tell someone else about it. Because community drives accountability. Community drives accountability. Community drives accountability. You know why we don't tell other people about it? Because we don't want to look foolish when we fail. I said last week, only 8% of people actually complete the year with the goals that they had in place at the beginning of the year. I I think we don't want to tell other people because we don't want to look foolish when 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 we don't accomplish it. What we do is, for the small minority of us who actually accomplish our New Year's goal, like at the end of the year, then we tell everybody. We're like, you know what I did this year? 
Man, I read my Bible from cover to cover, or I worked out every single day of the week. Like I, we, once we get to that point where we've, where we've accomplished it, then we want everyone to know about it. But here's what I believe. If we would tell more people about it, then more people would hold us accountable to it, which would actually drive up the probability of us actually uh, accomplishing our goal. Because community drives accountability. Community drives accountability. Tell someone what it is that God is stirring in your heart, in your life, to accomplish this upcoming year. But here's the thing. Don't just tell anyone. Tell the right people. And the book of Proverbs gives us some particularly helpful wisdom in this regard. We read this in Proverbs 13. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. The writer of Proverbs says, walk with the wise and become wise. Choose wise people to walk with. Like if the habit that you want to form is to be more present as a father, or if the habit is like to be more present as a spouse, like don't tell your online gaming friends. Like they're not going to hold you accountable. Don't, don't tell your work buddies. Tell the people who have a vested interest in you actually doing what it is that God is putting on your heart to do. Tell your wife, my goal this year is to be more present as a husband. Or tell your kids, kids, I, I, I've been distracted. My goal this year is to be present for you as a father. Tell the right people who can hold you accountable to what God is stirring in your life. And when it comes to your spiritual journey, you need to have people in your life who can do that, who can hold you accountable, which is why we talk about this all the time. You need to be in community. That growth doesn't happen in rows, it happens in circles. Like I, I believe that hopefully you come here every week that there's at least something that you can take away from this message to apply to your life, but the vast majority of us will leave and nothing will change in our lives because there's no accountability in rows. But when we put ourselves in a relationship with other people, people who have a vested interest in our growth, that we have to look across the room and say, this is what God is doing, and they ask, did you do what God asked you to do? When we have to say no enough, eventually we start saying yes because we want, we want not to disappoint. We want to actually step into who God is calling us to be. We were made for community. And so we talk about it all the time, that you belong in a group. If you come here on a Sunday and you're not in a group, you need to get in a group because you were made for community. And one of the best ways to, to get a taste of community is through something we do three times a year called Rooted. And Rooted is a discipleship experience that's intended to help you grow closer to God, to help you grow closer to other people, and to find your purpose. And what we've seen, not just in some of our lives, but in the lives of people who have tended, that Rooted is a catalyst for life change. But I can sit here and tell you all about Rooted, but instead of just listening to me, I want you to listen to Ron's story. Hey guys, I'm Ron Alford. I've been going to church at Lake Sawyer for a year and a half. And uh, so I was approached with the idea of starting Rooted and I felt a ton of resistance. Uh, really wanted to avoid the idea of doing something with that level of commitment. Uh, of course, all the normal excuses hit my head. Uh, I travel for work. I, uh, you know, I have an inconsistent, just all the, all the unique situations that I am, how special I am. And uh, really, it was just junk. The more I realized, like, this is something I've never done. I'm just really getting quiet with God for that length of time. And uh, man, I look back and I'm so glad I, I was all in. So glad I put my heart into it. So if you're on the fence, uh, one thing I struggled with was I was feeling talked into it. I was thinking about doing it for other people's reasons when I realized it's not about that. This is purely between God and I. This is something where I can grow with a group of people that also believe, you know, believe the way I believe and, and you know, we can grow together. But essentially, I'm, I'm devoting my heart to the time, you know, the one-on-one, -on -one, the personal side of it. and. Uh, that's where the transformation happened. So once I got past the resistance and the, the thought of, ah, other people are trying to talk me into this, 
then I realized there, how much growth I could have. And really, 11 weeks, it's not a big, big deal. A little bit of time each day. How much time do I have that I waste? Where if I just devote this, it's gonna make everything more sweet, right? My relationships, my business, my fitness, my spiritual, every little part of my life is gonna be sweeter when I'm having that quiet time with God. And I finally opened my heart to it, went into it, and uh, we had a blast. The couples laughing together, crying together, uh, just the community. We got to know each other on a level that none of us thought w was possible. And, and more importantly, we watched each other transform and grow closer to God throughout the whole journey. That was the best part. My name is Ron, and I want to help people find and follow Jesus. I love what Ron says, that there was a lot of motivation from the outside in, but at the end of the day, what really was the catalyst was recognizing that the motivation has to come from within. That I want to do this. I want to experience this. I want to commit to grow closer to God this year. And we really believe for a lot of us, this is what we need to do because we grow in community. We grow with accountability. A community drives accountability. And so coming up uh, next week, we're launching Rooted. And I know you might be thinking, well, it's, it's too late. I, I don't have time to sign up. You have time to sign up if you can prioritize really what matters the most, which should be your relationship with God. And so if you want more information about Rooted or you want to sign up for Rooted, you can go to lakesawyerchurch.org slash Rooted, and you can read all about it there. You can sign up there. I've been through it three times. And I can promise you, it doesn't matter if you're just new to the walk, you're new to your walk with God or you've been doing it your whole life, you will get something out of it if you put something into it. And so I encourage you to sign up for Rooted. We need to make our habits known. We need to make them easy. We need to make them obvious. But there's one other thing that I want to talk about this morning. And I think this is important because not all habits are equal. Like not every habit is the same as the other habit. There are certain habits that have cascading effects in our lives. They are known as keystone habits. And in his book, The Power of Habit, uh, Charles Duhigg, he kind of notes this reality. He notes these keystone habits, even identifying a few keystone habits. For example, families who eat dinner together. Like that's one small habit. Families who sit down and eat dinner together, what they have found is that those kids... Those children, in, in countless studies, have shown improved homework skills, that those kids get better grades, that they have greater emotional control, and higher levels of self-confidence. One small habit, one keystone habit, we're going to sit down every day, or as many days as we can, and we're going to eat dinner together, has a cascading effect in the lives of those children. Not all habits are created equal. I'm going to ask all of us to start one habit that I think is the most important single habit that you can have in your life that will absolutely transform every other area of your life. It's this, engaging in God's word. If you can make the commitment to engage in God's word, I promise you, it will change every area of your life. Matter of fact, the Center of Bible Engagement did a study on this, and they found that individuals who engaged in the Bible at least four times a week, listen to this, were less lonely, had less destructive thoughts, consumed less alcohol and pornography, and were more likely to share their faith. See, there's something about engaging in God's word that exposes to us our bad habits, and yet it calls us and guides us to better ones. The writer of Psalm 119 put it this way. He says, your word, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. The psalmist says, look, your word, God, it illuminates me on the right path, the path that leads me towards God, that leads me away from the allures of the world. But here's the thing. There's often a gap between what we know the Bible will produce or engaging in God's word will produce in our lives and our actual willingness to engage in it. And here's just a couple numbers. 58% of self-professing Christians engage with their Bible, open it up, read God's word less than four times a year. 
58%. People, we, we walk with Jesus and like, I just, I'm not experiencing transformation. I'm not experiencing change. Like, well, did you open your Bible and read God? I don't have time for that. Like, God just, just changed my life. Now, now that's 58%, which I think we could say, well, that's still, there's still a lot of us that are doing it. Now, here's the th- other statistic. 75% of self-professing Christians don't read their Bible more than once a month. I mean, look around that room. I mean, if, there, if there's 100 people in this room, that means 75 of you are probably not reading your Bible more than once a month. And we're wondering why we don't experience change. I'm telling you, this is the single most important keystone habit that you can develop in your life. These people were asked, why don't you engage in God's word more? There were two barriers that they cited in it. One is because it's such a big book. It's just so overwhelming. Like, we, we like something small. We like, you know, like Twitter. We like short articles. Like, this is, this is thousands of pages. Like, this is too much. This was one thing. Uh, it's too big. The other thing was that people said, I don't know where to start. When it comes to engaging in God's word, I don't know where to start. And so if you're in this category, like if you're literally in the 75% of of people who can confess and claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but don't engage in his word, let me help you out here. This might sound counterintuitive, but don't start at the beginning. I mean, I I don't want to be clear. I don't think that there's anything bad in the Old Testament. But when you start, you want to start in the New Testament. You want to start with the life and the person of Jesus. You want to start with his role and what he's done for all humanity. If you're going to engage in the Bible, I want to invite you to actually start in the book of Mark. The book of Mark, it's the shortest gospel account that's in the Bible. It's also, Mark is found in two-thirds of the other gospel accounts. Mark is a great place to start. And if you need just a little bit more encouragement, starting February 13th, we're going to spend 10 weeks as a church actually walking through the gospel of Mark, looking at these key moments, these key points in the life and the story of Jesus that helped transform our lives. And so you could actually commit this month to reading through Mark in preparation for what we're going to be doing as a church beginning February 13th. And so if this is you, uh, here's the thing. I'm going to take all of these things that we talked about and, and put it together. Make it obvious. Pick a time and pick a place, starting tomorrow. You're going to read through Mark. Pick a time and pick a place. Wherever that place is, open your Bible. If it's on your phone, make it obvious. This, ready for this? Remove every single app from the home screen of your phone except for your Bible reading app. I mean, think about it. You open your phone every day, it opens to your home screen. What if only thing you saw on that home screen was your Bible reading app? It would be a cue to drive the behavior. Make it obvious. Pick a time, pick a place, remove your apps except for this one, open your Bible on the chair you're going to read at, and then make it easy. This is how easy it is. I'm going to ask you to read one chapter every single day, five days a week. You get two days off. Five days a week, read one chapter a day. It will take you less than 10 minutes. Don't just read it, but think about it. Just sit on it. Maybe take one piece to apply to your life. And if you do that, you will finish the Gospel of Mark on January 31st. And you will have developed a habit and begun the process of informing your life, your soul, your whole body with the critical behaviors that can transform every single area of your life. But here's the last thing. Don't just do it alone. Don't tell a friend. Say to a friend, hey, I'm gonna do this. Mike said I should read Mark in the the month of January, so I'm gonna read it. Will you hold me accountable to read Mark? Will you do it with me? Tell your, your spouse, tell your group, tell someone else. Better yet, invite someone else to do it with you. See, often we think, well, I don't need community, but could it be that someone else needs the community that you could provide? Make it obvious, make it easy, make it known. And I'll tell you, this will be just the beginning because over time, and this has played out and produced results again and again and again and again and again and again, this singular keystone habit will completely revolutionize your life if you do it. And what we know is 75% of us Don't do it. And so if you want a better 2022, choose the right thing. Choose God's word and make a commitment to engage with it day in and day out. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this conversation. I thank you 
for the importance of habits and helping us understand how these habits can begin to change us, beginning first and foremost with our engagement in your word. So God, I pray that we won't just leave here and allow these words just to roll off our backs, God, but we would take this challenge, this commitment to prioritize your word, knowing, God, that it's what matters and it's what produces transformation in our lives. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share with you something that I've experienced in my life when it comes to engaging in God's word. Is as I've done this consistently over time, I have found that it begins to reshape, reform the way that I look at the world. It, it reforms my worldview, my perspective, not, not as I look through my own eyes, but as I look through the eyes and the value of Jesus. The way the Bible consistently over time has has reduced some of my fears, has reduced my anxiety, the way that it reminds me and draws me to what matters the most. The way it draws me to the presence of God and to the work of his son, Jesus. And again, as like I mentioned, there's a lot of us who are being very honest, and I'm not saying this to, to guilt you, if we're being very honest, we haven't made this a priority. We'll spend three, four hours a day on our phones browsing Facebook or reading news articles, but we can't find the time to find 10 minutes to study in the Word of God. And I think it's why we're gonna sing this song. We're gonna invite you. These words are powerful. I think some of us need to say we're sorry. Some of us need to acknowledge that we haven't made what should matter most the most important thing. And so over this next few moments, I'm gonna invite you just to stay seated, and Maddie's gonna sing these words over you. I want you to pray. I want you to process what this means and what God's word can mean for you in 2022.
to a time of communion. And if you haven't grabbed communion already, you can, uh, if you're in the room, there's some in the back. Um, if you're at home, this would be a good time to grab it. We're going to take it together this morning. The night before Jesus was crucified, Jesus gathered with his disciples and he shared with them what the body, his, uh, the bread and juice would resemble. And that was this, that bread resembled his body that was broken for us. And the juice would serve as a reminder of the blood that was poured out for us because it wasn't a mistake. Jesus did it intentionally because he loved us. And that very next day he was crucified so that we could have the opportunity to have a relationship with him. And just three days later, he rose and defeated death. So right now we're gonna take the bread together as we remember the body broken. And then we're gonna take the juice as we remember the blood that was poured out for us. like to invite you when you're ready to sing this together. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. be our prayer today. God, I surrender myself to you. We surrender ourselves to you. Let that be our prayer, God, every single day. And that we just want you because we don't need anything else. We just need you. And God, I just thank you for the sacrifice you made so that we had the opportunity to be with you. Thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name. If you would like prayer today, if you would like to explore a life of Jesus and you're in the room, I'd like to invite you to head on over to Guest Central and there will be people ready to pray with you. If you are tuning in online or you are in the room and just don't feel comfortable going over to Guest Central, I'd like to encourage you to text the word Jesus to 360-644-1711 and someone will get a hold of you shortly. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. We are so happy that you're here tuning in online, and I hope you guys have a wonderful week.